I am a proud uh, founding principal of Cornerstone Academy for Social Action Middle School in the Bronx. I'm blessed to have been a public school educator for 16 years. I'm also a parent. I'm a parent of three children. Uh, my oldest son is 14 uh, years old. He attends public school in New Jersey. Uh, my stepson is six years old. And my 18-month-old daughter, Maya, uh, is obviously the gem of all three. And for me, right now, you know, I'm a product of a public school, but right now I don't feel confident in placing Maya into a public school when she turns five. Because of the test and punish culture that we've created, there's, there's, a, there's a culture of fear that is permeating throughout public school, and it is stagnating curriculum and stagnating instruction. So I don't know if I would put Maya into a public school. Uh, fortunately for me, I have the means uh, to place her somewhere else, but think of the uh, New Yorkers throughout the state who do not have the means to place her into another setting. So what do we know, right? We know the research, we know the data, but for some reason we don't use it enough. We know that 15 years of high stakes standardized testing has not closed the achievement gap. As a matter of fact, it's what made it wider. We know, we know there is a language opportunity and executive function gap that exists between low income students and their middle and upper middle class counterparts. We also know that third grade literacy is predictive of high school and college graduation. So if third grade literacy is predictive of this, why are we testing every year? There's no need to test every year because third grade data will predict what happens later. And we need to focus more on the early childhood setting. So what I propose, I propose remove teacher evaluations aligned to state assessments immediately. I propose administer state assessments if you need to, created by teachers in fourth and seventh grade so the state can continue to identify struggling schools and districts and provide effective supports. I propose begin a statewide focus and conversation around authentic curriculum, instruction, and formative assessment. What drives student achievement is formative assessment, not summative assessment. When you are able to meet the individual needs of students, one-on-one -on -one and in small groups at the school level, that's when we see student achievement go through the roof. It's not summative assessments. Teachers have to be trained and given feedback and supporting students at the school level. So I support, I support more local assessments, less state assessments. Um, Lastly, we need to implement a birth to age eight program in our highest need districts. If we think we're gonna close the achievement gap without focusing on early childhood and birth to age eight, we're kidding ourselves. We might as well shut down the Common Core Task Force and do something else. We're talking about a population, we're talking about a population that's been historically disenfranchised through redlining, through crack cocaine, through other means, and we're not meeting them where they are and supporting their needs. So let me talk a little bit about Casa Middle School, okay? I'm, like I said, I'm a proud principal there. I've been there for seven years, and I hope the first thing that jumps out in this slide is our kids love coming to school, okay? There's nothing wrong with having a school where kids enjoy themselves and they're pushed academically to be their best selves. They love coming to school. And if you look at that picture on the bottom right, you see a teacher working one-on-one -on -one with a student while the other students in the back work cooperatively to figure out complex problems, okay, and complex tasks. So what have been the results? Last year on the New York State Assessment, we had the number one combined growth scores in New York City, okay? Unfortunately, because of you know, where we work and the population we have, we have about 80 to 90% of students come to us behind grade level. So what you see there in English, um, in 2014, we only had 10% of our students proficient. In 2015, that number jumped to 24.2%. In uh, 2014, we only had 18% of our students proficient in mathematics. 2015, that number jumped to 27%. But what's more important, in my opinion, is when you look at the right, we use a system in our school called iReady. I don't want to give them a, a plug here, but we use a system 
at our school called iReady, which allows us to track student progress over the year. So we give baseline assessments in September, mid-year assessments in, in uh, December, and end of the year assessments in June. And as you can see, uh, in reading, 64% of our students made significant growth, and 61% of our students in math made significant growth. And that's more important because, because we do assessment at the local level, we're able to identify the grade level in which students are operating and move them from that grade level. So where the state data doesn't really show that, the in-house data shows if a student comes in at the second grade level, we can move, it shows us how many levels we've moved that student. So we're a school uh, that's big on assessing the whole child, right? We've had a system, in my opinion, that's been too focused on the left side of the brain, analytical skills, verbal reasoning. All of our assessments are anchored in verbal reasoning. There's no holistic view of intelligence. We're ignoring this, despite all the research from Howard Gardner and many others. We believe that we need to put systems in place with the state support that look at the whole child. We have creative geniuses within our schools, and we're not able to tap into that. When you tie teacher evaluation to testing and school evaluation to testing, schools are going to get rid of the arts. They're going to get rid of project-based learning. They're going to get rid of all those things. And now all we're going to do is read, write, speak, and listen all day, which is important. But where is the creative side of the curriculum? I wanted to talk also about the partnership for 21st century learning. We live in an economy uh, that's driven by technology. We live in the 21st century. The Partnership for 21st Century, a conglomerate outside of DC, says that we should focus on the four C's of the 21st century, which include creativity, collaboration, communication, and critical thinking. And other than the communication piece, the Common Core Standards doesn't align to the other three. So how are, stu how are we gonna meet students' needs at that level to really prepare them for the jobs that we don't know are gonna exist in the next five years and for the major problems of our society. How are we gonna prepare them? And I added the, the bottom three, adaptability, meaning the ability to think on your feet and change with the times, initiative and metacognition. Bloom's taxonomy got it right in my opinion in 1952, Benjamin Bloom, right? So right now in schools, we're focused more on remembering, understanding and applying. And I know the Common Core was supposed to up the rigor, but what about the top of the Bloom's, of Bloom's taxonomy? How much analyzing, evaluating, and creating are we doing? We all know you learn by doing, right? We learn by doing, we learn by being hands-on, we learn by failing forward, receiving feedback, and then creating something new. The highest level of the Bloom's taxonomy is all about creating, evaluating, and analyzing, and we're stuck, in my opinion, at the understanding level with some level of applying through the writing Common Core standards, but we're not at the top of the taxonomy as I think we should be. So how do we get there, right? How do we meet the individual needs of students while also preparing them for a 21st century economy? In my opinion, the answer is design thinking. So design thinking is a problem-solving methodology that helps students to get to that highest the highest level of Bloom's taxonomy, but it's also a problem-solving mechanism. So, Students look, our students at CASA, for example, they brainstorm issues within their community, whether it's crime, violence, addiction, poverty. Our students engage in these topics very explicitly, and they go through the design thinking process to create solutions to these problems. Now, if we train teachers using design thinking or another methodology, gave them autonomy, trusted them, empowered them, imagine what our brilliant teachers throughout the state could create. But we're not doing that. We're handcuffing them and telling them, forcing them to teach a curriculum in a very specific way to very specific standards. We're not, I'm not anti-testing and anti-standards. I just want to emphasize formative assessments that meet the needs of individual students and empowers teachers. And the great thing, the great thing about this, this chart here, design thinking begins with empathy. And empathy begins with knowing your user. For teachers, the user is their student, right? If you're in a low-income community, nine times out of 10, you're gonna have students who are coming in at multiple grade levels. Through formative assessment, you can meet that student where they are and create an environment that really meets their needs. The way it's being done now, 
you're having a student who may be on a third grade level and you're forcing them to, to reach a seventh grade standard that they're not ready for. Kids develop differently at different times. And some kids are behind, so we have to meet their needs. One last point, formative over summative assessment. Formative assessment, again, focuses on the moment-to-moment, day-to-day needs of students, with teachers providing consistent feedback all the time. Formative assessment is embedded in quality instruction as a pillar of an organic learning environment. Formative assessment meets students where they are. So I want to end with a few quotes from Dr. Louisa Motes, one of the co-authors of the Common Core. She says, I never imagined when we were drafting standards in 2010 that major financial support would be funneled immediately into the development of standards-related tests. Realistically, at least half, if not the majority of students are not going to meet those standards as written. This is from one of the co-authors, okay? She says, our lofty standards are appropriate for the most academically able, but what are we going to do for the huge numbers of kids that are going to fail the park test? We need to create a wide range of educational choices and pathways to high school graduation, employment, and citizenship. The Europeans got this right a long time ago. In my opinion, I don't want to be second to Europe. And as a New York State resident, I don't want to be second to any other state. We need to lead in innovation, and we need to lead now. She goes on to say, if I could take all the money going to testing companies and reinvest it, I'd focus on a teaching profession, recruitment, pay, work conditions, rigorous, and ongoing training. She says, novice readers typically through third grade, not through second grade, we test in third grade now, through third grade need a stronger emphasis on the foundational skills of reading, language, and writing than on higher level academic activities that depend on those foundations until they are fluent readers. Again, this goes back to the birth to age eight initiative that I think we should be focused on. Stop paying Pearson and other companies for tests and invest that money in building birth to age eight programs. Because if we don't do that again, we're never gonna close this quote unquote achievement gap, which is really an opportunity gap. Lastly, she says, I'm beginning to get messages from very frustrated educators who threw out what was working in favor of new CCSS aligned program and now find that they don't have the tools to teach kids how to read and write. Teachers are told to use grade level text, for example. If half the kids are below grade level by definition, what does the teacher do? She has to decide whether to teach the standard or teach the kid. And that is what's happening in schools all over the state. Teachers are caught in this conundrum. They're frustrated, and they don't know what to do. I want to end with Maya. Once again, I want to place Maya into a public school. I think in New York State, and our, in particular, our diversity that we've never tapped into because of our fear of each other can empower us toward an innovative redesign of public education. Innovative redesign. Uh, Ms. Catalina told me in the back, she said, you have a very interesting school. I said, what do you mean? What do you mean by interesting? She says, it's very innovative. That's the best compliment she could have given me about my school. I want us to be innovative. And there's no reason why they can't. Private schools do not test this way. Progressive schools in other communities do not test this way. Why do we feel we need to test public school students every single year when we know the research and know the data? Tap into their individual brilliance. Every child is brilliant. Maya is brilliant. If we can design an instructional program that aligns the curriculum to Maya's needs, as well as Maya's brilliance, we could solve all the problems in the 21st century and change the world. Thank you very much.